We are in week two of our kickoff message series that we're calling Game Plan. We are tackling one of life's most persistent and sometimes agonizing questions. God, what is your plan for my life? It's a plan of football theme, but it's not meant simply to grab attention, but to reinforce that finding God's plan in our life shouldn't feel frustrating. Where God is concerned, there should be joy and optimism. It should feel more like a game that we play rather than a battle that we fight. It is our hope that over these four weeks, it will be a journey for you of self-discovery and maybe even transformation. Last week, we talked about the first step of a game plan, and that is that you have to be coachable. And we said that for a disciple, this means listening to and following Jesus. Part of the struggle of understanding God's plan for your life is that very often we misunderstand what success looks like. You know, because success cannot be simply reduced to the next major promotion or business deal. It can't be simply about making more money or acquiring more stuff. For our kids, it's not simply about the friends that you have or the grades that you earn. Nor is success about how you compare to others. As we're reading through St. Mark's Gospel, we're continuing from last week. Last week, Jesus and the disciples made a turn to head towards Jerusalem. And today, today we see them continuing that journey. They're in the north. They're now they're heading through Galilee towards Jerusalem, where Jesus is to be judged and condemned. Now, as we saw throughout Jesus' public ministry, crowds would gather around to hear his teaching and to witness the healings and the great signs that he would work. But here, we saw Jesus sort of trying to keep the movement of the disciples secret. It's kind of like Jesus is taking the disciples on a type of training camp, a period of intense preparation for the season ahead. And the disciples need it because they still seem to think that following Jesus is going to give them earthly success and a pleasant life. However, for the second time, we heard this last week, Jesus predicts his passion. He said, the Son of Man is to be handed over to men, and they will kill him. And after three days, the Son of Man will rise. What Jesus is trying to show us is that God has a hand in everything. And that everything happens for a reason. So then throughout the passion, when it looks like everything is utterly lost and out of control, no. Jesus, God is there and has a plan. And so it is for us. When things aren't going so well, when we've made a mistake or a fault, or, God is there. God has a hand in it. We call this providence, the ordering of things, God's intelligent ordering of things for our good. It's a hard truth to accept because when things are going really bad, when we've made a mistake, it's like we have that tunnel vision and all we see is that one bad thing and we forget everything else that's going on. And I'll push the envelope a little further. Even your faults, failings, and sins, and mine, were foreseen by God. And they play a role in our lives, an important role. Because everything that's happened before, for good or for ill, has helped bring us to this very moment. This very moment where we're surrounded by a community of faith, and this very moment when we will receive the Eucharist and the love that we enjoy and all of that. So, when you suffer a setback or a challenge or a misfortune, the important questions to ask are these. God, where are you in this? God, what are you teaching me? And God, 
Where are you leading me? Although in the gospel, we didn't see the disciples ask any of these questions. Rather, they turned their discussion to a self-centered debate. They're talking about which one of them is going to be the greatest. Now, Jesus, as he does with us, seems to listen quietly and patiently. But it's not until they get inside the house they're staying. And it's interesting. They go inside. And then once they're inside, Jesus invites them to look inward. And we heard him ask, what were you arguing about along the way? Now, at this point, the disciples remain quiet because they know that they've been caught. Now, if you watch football, maybe you've seen a game-changing play. It's like a long reception that no one expects to be caught, and it turns around for a, a touchdown. Or equally kind of striking, there might be a, a big interception. They run it all the way for a touchdown. Everyone is celebrating and happy, but then you notice that a little yellow flag had been thrown at some point. And everyone who was once so high becomes so low. <laughs> a flag on the play, it's negated it. It's demoralizing. We've all experienced this. But the flag doesn't mean you've lost the game. Rather, the flag only means that you've suffered a setback. And sometimes when you suffer a, se a setback, you bounce back even better. A setback is an opportunity to review, to reset, and to readjust. Setbacks are lessons for growth and improvement. And that's how Jesus is coaching the disciples here. He's sort of reviewing the tapes for them so that he can lead them into self-reflection on what it means to be great. And Jesus shows them that the measure of greatness cannot be made in comparison to others. We heard Jesus say, if anyone wishes to be first, he shall be the last of all and the servant of all. Now, think about this. Say, you know, two teams go to the Super Bowl. One team wins and one team loses. But have you ever heard of the losing team going back to their city and then throwing a were number two parade? <laughs> no, of course not. And this is a common struggle in our lives. We misunderstand what greatness is really about. And the disciples don't understand this any better than we do. That's why Jesus asks them, and that's why Jesus asks us to review and to reframe our understanding of greatness. Because greatness isn't about doing better than or comparing yourself to someone else. Like in football, you wouldn't compare the QB to the kicker. No, no. Greatness is about giving. The servant of all. Not getting. Who gets to be first. If you spent some time with the playbook that we gave out this past week, um, you know that we asked you to define greatness. Now, incidentally, I should say we only made, well, I thought we made a lot, but we made 500 playbooks. And do we have any left? A, a handful? <laughs> so I'm kind of happy about that. Only a handful left. So if you want a playbook, be sure to grab one at the end of Mass before the selfish people take them all. <laughs> No, no, I'm just kidding. The, um, I'm happy we ran out. It's a good sign, right? Um, and we have a PDF of it on our website if you want to grab one. Okay, Tom Brady. You've heard of Tom Brady referred to as the GOAT, right? GOAT, greatest of all time. Well, Tom Brady, it's well known that his strengths are not his mobility or his speed, but rather his ability to read the field and his power. And what a good coach does is he focuses on your strengths so that the player can reach their maximum potential. And so it is with each of us. God has given each of us, each of you, unique gifts. 
gifts that it's your duty to cultivate and to develop so that you can put them at the service of others. And that's what greatness is about. So what does greatness look like for a follower of Jesus? Jesus answers this question by taking a child and placing the child in the center of the huddle. The child is a symbol of helplessness, of vulnerability, and dependence. The child has nothing of her own. She has no successes or accomplishments or money or anything. Everything she has, she has received. So greatness is not a badge of honor or a, a playing level to be achieved. Rather, greatness is a quality that by God's grace arises in us. And it grows the more our lives are in balance and the more that we follow Jesus along that path to a better life where we become better versions of ourselves. That's the life that Jesus promises. So the challenge for this week is to stick with the playbook and maybe consider these questions. What does greatness look like in your life? And what has God taught you through a setback? And then after that setback, how did you bounce back?